Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Assassin's Den podcast. I'm your host, Loomer. Uh, and today we have a very, uh, well, slightly different episode than usual. Um, usually we talk to people um, usually involved with the making of the game, but today I'm pleased to be joined with Stephen Totillo, who is the editor-in-chief of Kotaku. Hello, Stephen. Hey, how's it going? Good. Thank you so much for um, taking the time to join and chat um, I think it, there's a lot of stuff I want to cover. I think it's going to be really interesting to kind of just explore the series a, a bit, and um, especially Kotaku's role in some parts <laughs> of it too, as well. But you know, what do you mean? What did we? Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. Well, okay. So uh, just to let people know, I was uh, this episode is going to basically be kind of structured into three parts, kind of chrono- chronologically. Um, first, we'll talk about Stephen's kind of history of the series because he's a big fan, and that's part of the reason I really wanted to, to chat about this. And then, of course. Kotaku itself has become part of series history with the leak of victory, I would say. Um, and then we'll talk about um, Syndicate and Jack the Ripper and thoughts on that. So we won't really get into spoilers, I think, until the very end. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to start off, Stephen, um, just say, like, you know, I think it's really cool that um, you're the editor-in-chief of Kotaku, who, you know, it's one of the biggest gaming sites. And mm-hmm. I just think it's really cool that you're such a huge AC fan, which I've noticed for a while. I've seen you... Uh, there was at least one article I know that was kind of referenced, like the Assassin's Creed subreddit. It was kind of sourced yes. from there, and yes. like, um, and I know you've been a big fan of the series for a while. So I thought maybe we would kind of just start with uh, how do, how you got into this series, like when and when you kind of fell in love with it. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't know that reading the Assassin's Creed subreddit is the the clear um, indicator <laughs> of being the most hardcore Assassin's Creed fan <laughs> that that on the staff or whatever, but. This is, but it's. I certainly is a subreddit that I quite enjoy checking out, and I think that's a re- it's a really good community over there. Uh, I like your podcast as well, and really just enjoy oh, the. Uh, I like the, the the community around the game a lot, but I, I I am a huge fan of the series. I've enjoyed it for a long time. I'm sometimes hesitant to talk about what I'm a big fan of um, as the editor of the site because even though I also write reviews and obviously I'm giving my opinion on things, I, I'd like people to think that I'm choosing what we cover based more on what I think our readers are interested in than what my personal passion is. But that said, it's pretty obvious, right? If you look at Assassin's Creed coverage on, the, on, on Kotaku, I write about the series a lot. And one of the things I've done, I think at least since Assassin's Creed 3, is that I've discovered that there, these games are really rewarding to go back to months later if you haven't 100 percented them yet. And I typically play a lot of games. And uh, I'll find it in October or November when the new one comes out I'll play enough to not just review the game by having finished the campaign, but usually have played a fair amount of the side quests, but I never get to do all of it before the review. And so what I would start to do is I would go back to them in the following spring, and I would start to write these follow-up articles, 12 more hours, 20 more hours. I think my Assassin's Creed Rogue one is I went back and I played like for 24 more hours. There was so much more stuff to find and and do in the game, and I just have a great time with it. Yeah, it's been awesome. It's been a really fun series that scratches I guess a lot of the itches I have I, I like single player gaming I like uh, third person action games I like mm-hmm. platforming I like puzzle solving I like the history stuff I like a game that's in a new setting I was kind of laugh at people who say oh, Assassin's Creed is just like Call of Duty it's the same thing every year and it's like no it's not yeah. at all the same thing <laughs> right, every, right. <laughs> yeah. it's very different every year and that's part of what's so cool about it yeah yeah it's, it's definitely cool. one a series that I think um, you know yearly releases are very controversial of course and um, but, you know, Assassins, I think, is set up better than almost any other franchise to kind of handle that kind of structure, I feel like, and still be able to keep things fresh. Um, I was wondering, uh, when ex- when did you get uh, involved with this series? Is it, did you come in straight with coverage from AC1 and you played it then? Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I've i been at Kotaku since 2009. The series um, started, the first game came out in 2007. Mm-hmm. And uh, my first Assassin's Creed-related memory is... Um, E3 2007, going to the booth, the Ubisoft uh, area, and they had a closed booth where you could go inside and you could play a little bit of it. And we knew, we knew so little of the series back then in, in June of 2007. I remember that Jade Raymond, the producer of the series at the time, was there kind of talking people through playing. And I, I played a little bit of Altair. I don't remember which city he was in. Uh, and what I'm remembering is like a little bit of the the glitching. You know how like we didn't know there was a modern sequence yet. They were kind of <laughs> to that, but you had so you're just like, why is this matrix code or whatever? Yeah, showing up in the corner. DNA sequences yeah. flying across the screen. Yeah, <laughs> using very coy about that. So that was the first <laughs> first memory. Um, and then another really kind of fond memory I have of the first series 
is that I, I was working for MTV at the time, and they have offices in Times Square in a big skyscraper. And uh, occasionally, you know, usually if I was being sent a game for review, it was sent in the mail. Occasionally there would be people who would do sort of delivery stunts. So like Nintendo delivered a Wii to me in the back of a police car, which was really weird. I never quite <laughs> understood why they did that. So they're like, can you come downstairs? And they had a police car and the trunk open and here's your Wii. Yeah. Um, but uh, Patrice Desolais, who all of your listeners know, is the, uh-huh. was the creative director of the first three Assassin's Creed games. Mm-hmm. And is just you know the the, the main reason the series exists. Yep. Um, he hand delivered me my copy of Assassin's Creed. Oh, I guess so cool. Ubi- Ubisoft dispatched him to go to New York with copies of the game, which is really cool of them. And yeah. uh, he came by and he's like, "Not only am I going to give you the game, but I want to watch you start playing it." And so we popped it into the PS3, I guess, and. Uh, very early on in the game, maybe even before you start playing, I can't remember, you have one of the signature uh, loading screens, you know, the stuff that got rid of from Unity that we all got so angry about. It's like White Room running around yeah, type yeah. stuff, yeah. And I didn't know any better, so I didn't touch the controller. And he's like, you can <laughs> run during that. And I was like, oh, it's like, oh, it's so great. It's so amazing. Your loading screen's so good. Um, but I, I, yeah, I had a really good time playing that first game and, you know, like a lot of us was a little bit disappointed that it began to feel like it was repeating itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can tell you stories about every single release really, but you know, it goes yeah, from sure. AC2 when I was seeing that in previews and talking to Jade and I was like, either she's giving me the best sales pitch of all time or they really have corrected every problem with AC1. <laughs> and, uh, they really had corrected every problem with AC1, and yeah, I remember yeah. talking about that beforehand and not being sure whether I should believe the hype. Um, seeing, uh, seeing AC3 early, um, you know, seeing a lot of these games early, but also I, I enjoyed reporting on them. I had a really good conversation with Patrice, I think, between the release of 1 and 2 at, a, at PAX, so that would have been September of 2009, I think, and... Uh, one of the things that people had talked about with AC1 was what was the, what was the point of all the flags? What was the point of collecting all those flags? And I remember we, we had a conversation about that, and he was laughing. And I'm like, you know, what, what's so funny? And he says, well, and I've always I've referred to this quote so many times um, when talking about video games with people. He said, video games to me are like a conversation. They're a conversation I'm having with the players. And he said, my what I was saying in this conversation was that you don't need to collect things. There's no point to collecting things. I'm not going to give you a review <laughs> for collecting things. And he said, and clearly the, the response to the other end of that conversation with the player saying, no, we want to have a reward. So he said, you'll see my response to that in Assassin's Creed. <laughs> and I think, wasn't it in AC2 where, is that the one where the mom is yep. praying until you get the last... The feathers. Last that, feather and that gets your up. little brother yeah. used to collect and everything. And yeah, it's... That it's really funny that you talk that you that you tell the story about Patrice talking about that because I've always kind of maintained that like the the games that Patrice worked on did such a good job in general of trying to explain things not just the collectibles but you know things like um, respawning is explained by desyncing from the animus and like you can trace that kind of thing even back to Sands of Time where. Um, if you die, it's in the framework of the prince telling a story, and he'd be like, "Oh wait, no, that's that's not, that's how not it what happened." happened. Yeah, exactly. and I, I I love that, and I you know so few games go out of their way to explain things like the HUD and all that, and the flags in AC One notwithstanding, pretty much everything else has like a narrative reason to be there, and you know they introduced full sync and brotherhood. Um, and it was explained as, you know, if you get even closer to what you did to your ancestors did, you'll be mm-hmm. able to access like their repressed memories. And you got this yeah. really cool narrative reward with Christina and everything. And it's something that seemed to drop off. And like I attributed a lot to Patrice, not just because of Sands of Time, but because after Brotherhood, that kind of feeling just kind of dropped off to the point of unity where it's literally the flags of AC1 that Patrice said that there was no point to collecting them like times a thousand, right? Like it's yeah. just your map is littered with go collect this cockade, go get this chest, go get this mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, all this other crap that's just floating around like <laughs> and pick Which, up this it, thing of armor on the wall and it's just like, okay, yeah. why, what? <laughs> but to, to, be, to be fair, because while yeah. I think we both have great respect for Patrice, he's not the only yeah. game director with good ideas and they don't oh, need to all be compatible. When you, if you look at Super Mario 64 and you compare that to the Super Mario games that came before that that were side-scrollers, and you question why there are coins in either the side-scrollers or <laughs> Super Mario 64, and you can actually question why they exist in the previous games, and I can't 
or I'm not trying to name drop, but I, I have talked to Shigeru Miyamoto about all these games, and I can't remember if we ever talked about that. But I do know that when we, t- we talked at some point about Mario 64, and the idea that the coins that are in the, in the 3D game were there to help point out areas that the player might not otherwise go to. That once a game is in right. three dimensions, it's harder to direct the player in the direction you want them to go to. So you can be a designer or an artist and have created a whole corner of the game that the players won't see unless there's something pushing them there. And the simplest way to do that is to put a collectible. And if you look at the, the um, collectible placement of, say, the, um, I forget what it is, is it feathers or something else in the trees in AC3? The like fragments, they, yeah. Yeah, the fragments. They actually place them in ways that really encourage you to jump through the trees in really interesting patterns and it became very, uh, I found sort of physically pleasing to go after the fragments in AC3 because they created really good running lines and really good platforming paths and sort of tree paths. And I saw that continue and evolve, not so much in Unity, but AC Rogue actually has its collectibles laid out really well. And if you go hunting them down, you wind up getting taken through these really interesting and in some cases just very beautiful looking paths that are way off the main you know main path of the game before we move on to the next part i just get your quick thoughts on some of the more kind of controversial aspects of assassin's creed on what your thoughts are so modern day um yes or love no it. do you love I it i love modern day i i, <laughs> I you know i I would trade the leaks that we've had about Assassin's Creed that we've published for like a really good inside story. Like, like w- <laughs> I would think that's interesting, right? Like, I don't. This is where people sort of like they flip out over the the stuff and they're like, "Oh, so disrespectful to creators to to run these things that get leaked to you." And I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Sure. Um, but I actually am as a reporter as well as somebody who appreciates the series. I would love to know more about those creative decisions, and there really isn't a good outlet for that. I mean, clearly at some point, somebody decided while making Assassin's Creed Unity not to have a significant modern-day section to it, right? Did they decide that because Rogue was already going to do it? Did they decide because the focus testing told them that people don't want to do it? Yeah, but somebody makes that decision, right? And those kinds of inside stories, while I imagine some people would feel very invasive to have that kind of inner workings of their creative process be exposed, I think that the sort of that sort of ideal, perfect amount of communication between creators and fans would get us to some of the understanding of what they think themselves of the modern day. Yeah. I, but I'm, yeah, certainly personally, I, I love it and I, I hope it's in every game, but I know how divisive it is, so I'm not surprised that it doesn't make it into everyone. The modern day, I feel like, is one of the most closely guarded things at Ubisoft. Like, I've literally had two podcasts planned in the past um, uh, talking to people about the modern day, and those are, I think, are the only two podcasts Ubisoft has ever shut down. Um, yeah, I find it really doing. weird. I find it really weird, actually. I mean, it's a part of it, the... I get that they want to keep secrets, but I actually yeah. think, it's, I think it's a little bit unfair to people who are interested in the series that they're so coy about modern day every year. And But this is one of those yeah. where I try to separate my own fandom <laughs> appreciation of it. But I just think like that if you have people that are that for whom it's that important and you keep asking and they keep asking and they're left to have to just sort of read through like vague statements and try to interpret, I just feel like it does a disservice to everybody. And I think that well I, I recall that in the lead up to Syndicate, I remember people really tying themselves up in knots trying to figure out what are the what what are the hints indicating regarding having yeah. more day. And I think I don't understand and this is, I guess, this would lead into our discussion of some of the leaks. I do not understand why in in gaming culture in general and with the AAA gaming industry, the secrecy is so intense that it just becomes, that it winds up having to become this really sort of tortured, distanced, trying to interpret vague clues and comments type thing that I think doesn't serve anybody. I think that it doesn't really serve the creators either. And I just don't understand the value and the virtue of of having things be that vague. I mean, if you want to surprise people on stuff, you can surprise them on things that are genuinely new. But if it's that you are going to resume doing something you've done before that people have been asking for, why not just say that? Like say, well, no, there's nothing playable here, but we appreciate the f- the fans of the modern day, and so we're going to do something with audio and text that we think they'll enjoy. Like what would be the, like, the, <laughs> what would be the problem saying that? Of 
course, flashback about a year ago, um, Kotaku publishes a story called Next Year's Big Assassin's Creed is set in Victorian London. And this was, let's see, uh, December 2nd. And so Mm -hmm. at this point, Unity had been out for about maybe two, two and a half weeks. Yeah. About. Yeah, a few weeks. And this article has been kind of like, <laughs> I it mean, was it an intentional leak? <laughs> <laughs> well, like, yeah. So there's, there's lots of stuff to, to unpack about this article. Um, yeah. One thing was, I noticed this in your own comments and even up until this follow-up article that you published recently, yeah. um, a lot of people, I mean, some people I saw even in the comments of the initial article were like, oh yeah, Ubisoft quote unquote leaked this. And, you know, they think it's, uh, you know, and to be fair, you know, companies like Apple and stuff do do intentional leaks sometimes to like okay. drive up. Uh, you know, hype or whatever, but like mm-hmm. we can, I think it's fair to say we can, if it wasn't <laughs> clear from the last article you wrote that this was definitely not an yeah. intentional leak, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, they were, uh, if they, they were then, I guess, faking their anger in reaction to the story. Yeah. <laughs> they were it. I think Ubisoft's approach is that they try to maximize the sales of the given game that they're selling for $60 and they believe, clearly, clearly from the way that they steer the Assassin's Creed franchise, they believe that if you were to know or even be thinking about the fact that there's going to be another one in the next year, that that would dissuade you from buying the current one. And at the time, Unity for them was a game that I sh- I'm sure was a much harder sell than they yeah. wanted it to be because it had such a stink on it due to the you know pe- what people were saying about its technical performance. Some of which I thought was overblown. Actually, the game didn't perform that badly for me when I yeah. reviewed it. Um, I had some frame rate issues in one of the church sequences but otherwise technic- te- the technical performance was the least of my issues with that game I just thought the, <laughs> the missions were boring and yeah. that there was a, a, a deficiency of side, uh, side content you know what's funny is that Syndicate has actually been as buggy for me as Unity was um, when I played through both of them yeah, on launch, same. you know, starting from launch. And it's like I've had the same number of hard lockups. I've I've had uh-huh. multiple times in Syndicate where I had to restart a mission because the game got me in a stuck state. I've, yep. um, like, I've had a, a little more. I've had a little more with Syndicate than I have had with yeah. Unity. And that it's whole crazy. Like, that no face thing, that famous image of the woman with no yeah, face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never even have gotten a straight answer on how that was actually created. I, I'd so, heard from somebody at Ubisoft who said that you only got that if you didn't have a certain patch, like you didn't have the day okay, one. Patch. So, so here's what it was. It was basically there were two. It was on the PC. Like as soon as I saw it, I'm like, oh, this is a PC issue. There's no way this is like a um, that early in the game. Like there's no way that that's gonna happen on consoles where they know the hardware. And so what yeah. it ended up being was it was I think it was literally two types of graphics cards on the PC right. um, that would trigger this, and it was only if you hadn't installed the day one patch. And it, like I figured yeah. it had to be something like that because like you would only see the same like. I don't know, like th- five images of this floating around. And like when you have a glitch like that and it's like as pervasive in the game yeah. as, it, as it clearly was, if you can trigger it, you know people would get like tons of hilarious screenshots and like frightening screenshots out of it. Yeah, there, there are other, other glitches. Like there's the basketball player who was sort of in the, the Jesus crucifixion pose and everybody was able to replicate that, I think. Yeah, and so I, fe- and so I actually feel like a lot of the backlash against Unity, um, even though I do... Th- I absolutely think they should not have released it in that state. And I actually think the same for Syndicate. I think they both released with an unacceptable number of bugs. But like, I think Unity got a disproportionate amount of um, attention towards it just because those images are so visceral and it's so easy for... And like, I think a lot of um, the, the gaming news outlets use that... Like Anytime they report on anything about Unity and or like yearly releases or glitches or anything, it's like, you know, slap that photo on and like everyone's like, oh my God, that's crazy. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, if you... My review of Unity noted its technical performance being not a, a major issue for me yeah. um, and I actually think that like when was, well, Ubisoft eventually apologized for the game and I think they focused yeah. on apologizing for the technical performance I felt like some of that was theater like they felt like well people think that the problem is glitches so we'll apologize for those glitches and then you know release you know make the season pass free and all that jazz yeah. but ultimately to me the core problem of the game was that it was it was just, like I was saying before, it was deficient in the amount of stuff to do and the stuff that you could do, and it was not fun or interesting enough. And it just felt, felt like it was uh, like half-made in terms of you know, what you expect from the, the quality and quantity of an Assassin's Creed game. And that would have been, to me, the reason that you would have wanted it to be, you know, been sp- spent more time in the oven. And that's why I wasn't convinced that Assassin's Creed Syndicate coming out a year later, obviously overlapping dev cycles, but I wasn't convinced that it was going to you know, ha- be as, as substantial as it should have or could have been, and it's actually come yeah. closer to the scale that I would that I would have hoped for it to be. So, yep. you know, they they prove that they 
they can still develop a pretty meaty game even with this this annual um, the way they do the staggered annual releases. So, so actually, pulling back to the to the leak of victory a little bit, which yeah. I think was notable. Um, kind of for the scope of it and also for yeah. how early in the cycle it came to it. Yeah. Right now, I just want to kind of set up the situation real quick. So uh, so one question that actually has come to mind is, did you guys pay for the, the leak in any form or whatever? No, and I'll just sort of anticipate some of your questions. Yeah, we, sure. um, we, didn't, we don't go digging through Ubisoft's trash to find out what the next year's Assassin's Creed game yeah. is going to be. And I think as people know, follow the series closely, this stuff tends to leak on its own anyway. And so while... Sign- Kotaku has had significant stories about many of the Assassin's Creed games before they were officially announced. In very few instances were we actually the first people to say anything about it. So if you go back to Assassin's Creed Unity, for example, where we ran some in-development screenshots as part of our story that was confirming that Unity was a new game that was coming only to the new-gen consoles, that there was a second game in development for the old-gen consoles. There had already been reports, I think on, I may get the outlet wrong, but I think it was the Examiner or some other smaller site that had had a lot of that information. Mm-hmm. And we were, just, we were then tipped by somebody that uh, they were able to confirm that stuff and even provide some visual proof. And I felt, as for reasons I've articulated publicly before, that it's our job in order to um, inform our readers about things. And in this case, if there's rumors out there already and we can confirm them mm-hmm. or, or, or prove why they're wrong, then it's part of what uh, people are, you know, quote unquote, paying us to do in terms of the readership coming to the site. And so sure. with uh, Syndicate, though, or, yeah, or Victory, as it was called then, yeah. there was not really much of a rumor about anything that was coming. I don't think that many people were anticipating um, Industrial Revolution London or anything of that nature. Um, but we wound up with access to, through a tipster, to a, a seven-minute video, really slick, um, ultimately graphics that are better than what we played as a game, but the, the video said that it was produced in engine. And I think like, this is common, right? They create a game, it has a certain look to it before they have to be able to, you know, sort of downgrade it for whether it's they've made it on a PC and they now have to have be able to run on a console or whether it's because once you have AI and, you know, other stuff happening, you can't push the graphics as hard. But we had this spectacular looking seven minute video that could have passed for an E3 trailer and there we have it at an unprecedentedly early time in terms of when you normally find out about these games but sure. uh, also the game had been in development for clearly a long time and I thought I could not justify not telling our readers what we knew that people everybody's talking about Assassin's Creed right now in the state of the franchise well we can confirm to you there's one coming next year it's being led by the, a studio that's never led a full-on AC before it's being led by a studio that had done the you know a lot of the good DLCs. Um, the weekend and it's sort of inherent with Assassin's Creed is that if you say even just the tiniest bit about where it's set or whatever, you kind of wind up giving away like a core surprise, and that's kind of an unfortunate aspect of this. Mm-hmm. Um, that it sort of cuts both ways, right? I mean, I I'm not trying as much as people may not believe this. I'm not trying to ruin the surprises of the series for everybody. I simply go by if. People are going to tip us information. You know, what can we, what can we do to confirm and inform things to our readers? And 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 that's and that's what we did. And at the time, people were, I think, largely into it. They were excited to know that, as disappointing as Unity was, that there was something being built on its foundation that seemed more ambitious. And we were <laughs> able to talk about things like the rope launcher, that indicated that they were rethinking things. Because that was one of the issues of Unity is that it was so conventional and how it played other than the co-op they didn't really do anything to innovate the gameplay and i mean i guess they changed eagle vision right so they, they well, but they didn't do anything I, don't know. I mean they overhauled the the i mean they completely overhauled the parkour system the combat i mean they did go back to the pillars and change each one of them up kind of uh fundamentally in a way in how they behave You're right um, but i felt like i was doing the same thing in ac unity mm-hmm. that I'd done in every other assassin's creed game you know climbing to the lookout points you know i I felt it had a lot of the same rhythm to it, and I felt like seeing that they're doing this grappling hook kind of thing, you know, Arkham style, right. that that was another indication of more radical change, and I thought that was a, a thing worth, worth, yeah. worth telling people. I completely respect the fact, though, that people who I respect their Ubisoft were probably very unhappy about the fact that sure. their baby was being shown by somebody other than its parents early and so i don't i don't hold it against them for being you know, furious for this <laughs> yeah well so i mean i think there's there's a few things here i mean one is that i i mean if you look at the comments for that original leak it's not people being like oh i'm so happy to see something being built i literally the first the comment here is oh god please just stop no more ac 
create a new IP, I promise you I'll buy it. And then one of them is the mangled face of baby Elise um, going, I'm ready for next, another next-gen adventure. And yeah. then another one below it is, if this was right after AC2, I'd be super excited, but as it stands five games later, I can't give a shit. Like, sorry, you'd be less. So, I don't know. But that's, that's, quite... that's the truth. I mean, that was the truth of the situation. And it's not my, it's not my job to worry that, like, they're, that they've mismanaged their franchise and released a game that angered people. It's my job to make sure that people, you know, if I can tell them what's going on, tell them what's going on. And, like, the bummer is that it sounds like Syndicate hasn't done nearly as well as uh, Unity in some of the games before in terms of sales. And, like, as much as you and I love the series, it does seem like people were burnt out. And those comments there are an indicator. An indicator. A lot of times it's kind of like its sales are at least partially determined by how the last game did. So, you know, yeah. everyone pretty much agrees that AC4 was better than AC3, but AC3 is the best selling game in the franchise and AC4 sold significantly less. And you see the right. same thing like, you know, Unity was really hyped up, crashed and burned spectacularly, and now Syndicate's mm-hmm. kind of paying for it, even though it's the better game. But yeah. so, okay, so why don't we uh, like back up a little bit? So um, I think a lot of. Um, at least from the Ubisoft side, the, the target gameplay footage is kind of like a key part of this, right? So if, like, for people who don't know, um, target gameplay footage is pretty common. And um, in Assassin's Creed games, uh, you know, it's produced near the start of d- production um, to give the team a common, like, like kind of like an anchoring like a, of a vision to work towards. Yeah. And if you go on YouTube, it's, there's actually you can find the AC3 target gameplay footage. Um, which is really fascinating. It, these things are really fascinating to watch, like as kind of like a historical thing. That's the one in the woods where he goes into the tree and jumps down and takes out like the, the drummer boy. Yeah, oh. and he does the whole like flippy rifle thing and then puts the guy's head on it and shoots it. That was in the reveal trailer. It shows that like in gameplay and so like some other stuff. And it looks somewhat familiar, but it's also very, it's like a bizarro world AC3. Yep thing and it's really fascinating to look at kind of like from a historical perspective um these are never meant for for public consumption like none of the other ones have been released and it's really just internally for the team right and you guys even note this in the article um and i think this this is overshadowed by everything else in the article but let me see if i can find it uh thanks to seven minute target gameplay footage leaked to kotaku um it's surprisingly slick Although it may not represent what the final game looks like, it does proclaim that it's produced entirely in Anvil. In other words, it wasn't pre-rendered. Right. right. And so when this came out, I was very unhappy, <laughs> like just as a fan. I thought it was really not great. And it's the decision to, to publish this information, I think, was I, I very, very much disagree with. And so w- when I see this, and like I understood immediately that it was like the target footage, yeah. um, a lot of the reason that Ubisoft, and I'm, I'm only speaking just from my perspective here, and by the way, while we're, ta- while we're talking about conspiracy theories um, about earlier about um, if Ubisoft had yeah. intentionally leaked this or whatever, I just want to say like right now, just to clear anything up, like Ubisoft did not ask me to do this interview in any way or <laughs> anything like Like nobody knows. I don't, I don't think many people think think anybody would think that, but okay. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> it'd be like, hey, yeah. like I noticed like you and Steven, like you talked to Steven for that article about Ezio and Chronicles China, like you should like talk to him about victory nothing like that obviously (laughs) just like from my own perspective like looking at this it's like a a large part i think of why the team uh why it would upset the team is that a lot of this is not like i said it's only meant for internal consumption and when i'm looking through these screenshots right now a lot of this is not actually representative of the game itself and it's not necessarily um it's not just the fact that it was leaked early like i think if you guys had just leaked the fact that to be clear to be clear we didn't leak it somebody leaked it to us and this may seem like semantics to you or to other sure. people but yeah but you guys chose to publish it when a journalist whose job it is to yeah. inform their readers about true things that are interesting to the readers and they run a video game website where people are interested in what's going on with big games and small games and somebody leaks you information, like, to an extent, you do have to think through, like, what are the consequences and how will people feel? How will the readers feel? How will the people be involved feel? But as I said in the piece that I wrote about the blacklisting, it is nearly unfathomable to me that we would not report on what we are told to be true or what we are shown to be true. So I actually am with you in realizing and knowing that it would probably upset people who I had a great deal of respect for and still do have a great deal of respect for there. Sure. But as, as much of a jerk as I may sound when I say this, like I focus on, first and foremost, what is my job in terms of being a reporter and an editor in terms of informing my readership? And I don't like the idea of the readers finding out 
in May of 2015, oh, you knew about this game for six months and you didn't say anything to us about it? Like, who do you work for? And that's, that's the thing. Like, I don't, well, I, 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 I would be fine to not get a leak of, Assassin's, of the next Assassin's Creed. And I wouldn't say to my team, damn it, we need to find out what next year's is. Go start digging. Like, I'd be fine for it to not happen. Sure, uh, sure, but sure. if I'm given access to a seven-minute video at a time when the series is under a huge microscope in term, an intense scrutiny in terms of where it's at. And I now know that they're not looking to take a year off. They're not looking, they're not repeating, they're not building on Arno in terms of treating him like an Ezio and doing a second Arno game. That right. this is the direction that they're going in. That this indicates that Montreal is going to be getting an extra year on AC or that Montreal is moving away from AC because it's, it's you know, because Quebec is leading on this. If I have that yeah. information, then I think it's, it's my job. And so when we ran the, the, the Unity information and showed some screenshots, I had more pause on that one because I knew that the game was going to look better than it looked in those shots. And we even have a bold line in that one that says, you know, please remember, realize these are, not, these are in development. I felt bad about that. And in retrospect, I think we could have, you know, maybe we should have run fewer shots. But I think even one shot would have given people the false impression that Unity was going to be a bad looking game. Uh, and so I was sensitive to that when we had the seven minute video, which notice we didn't run not we didn't run a seven minute video, we didn't run a one minute video, we didn't run anything of it in motion, and we actually were very sparing in the images that we ran, just images that I felt would convey those key details that we knew. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that well, many people will say, "Oh, you're a hero, you exercise all this restraint because people will say, as you might, you could have just not run the whole thing at all, but it's very hard for me to to see that as a, as a reporter with a readership that relies on me, that the proper decision would have been to not cover it at all. Well, yes, but that's my point, is that, um, you know, I don't think you shouldn't have run anything at all, and readers would come to you and be like, oh, Yo, you knew about this game, like, why didn't you say anything? But obviously, there's a line with that you draw on how much of this information you reveal. And as you said, like, you could have run the entire, like, you could have just leaked the whole seven-minute, like, target footage instead, but you guys instead... They might have had a copyright claim on that, so I don't think, I can't actually, I, I can't... Say we really could have done that, right? If okay. Seven well, minutes, you know, could have <laughs> but I mean, could I? Could we have run? A, could we have run a, a you know a, a one minute loop or a thirty second loop? And claim fair use on it? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, but you also could have just put the seven minute and it could have gotten copyright claimed, but it's out there. You can't erase it from the internet. People would have seen it, right? Like if you really thought this was like some super important information that needed to be out there. You could have also cut a one minute video, as you said, or like, you know, made some some loops, some gifs. And so I think it's like the extent of what you put in there is almost as important as like whether or not you leak anything at all. And so, you know, do you just say, oh, there's a new one coming in. It's um, Victorian London and you be Quebec is developing it like that would be a really quick blurb you could do but in this case it's not too far removed from the final product because you described the entire footage um, and you published a bunch of screenshots from it and so okay, so here's here's what happens like when I see this like mm -hmm. uh, from the perspective of a fan the reason that I get upset about this is because I see this and knowing knowing what target gameplay footage is it's I know that this is not what people like these screenshots it's never going to be, it's never going to look like these screenshots exactly. Like, you know, like I said, like the AC3 footage looks like a bizarro world of AC3, even though sure. some parts are similar. And then like even looking through this, you know, the change outfit thing where he runs over, grabs a top hat from a lady um, is not in the game. Um, the grappling hook is actually like a grappling hook that you swing across, very right. different from how the rope launcher ended up being in the main game. But so I, I see, and it's called AC Victory, which I knew at the time was, was the code name. And, you know, like these code names are never meant for um, the final game. Like Unity is, I think, literally the only game in a Assassin's Creed history that's shipped with its code name. Everything right. else has, well, it gets revised later. And so now I'm like, oh, well, this is going to suck for marketing because now they have um, two names in the game that they'll have to deal with in the future. But that was like the least of my thing. But basically, so I see this and it comes, I, I think the timing of this is just as important too, I think. And so I see this and I think, I, I try to look at it like from the perspective of like everybody involved. And so it's like from Ubisoft's side, this is clearly a bad thing on many levels. Like on the marketing and PR front for sure, um, just because, you know, the, it's a leak, a really big leak, and now that it messes with their whole marketing cycle. That I'm not like as, I'm sympathetic to, but it's not like my main point of contention here mm -hmm. or whatever. But certainly it's an issue, right? And of course, then internally now security is going to be like, who the fuck like did this to their team and right. like leaked this footage. And right. um, the, the other thing 
thing is like, you know, the developers on the team, you know, this was their big game. This is their, you know, they worked on Tyranny of King Washington, Freedom Cry, and now Quebec. This is like their big thing. And yep. to have it revealed as the target gameplay footage instead of actual the things that they've been working on is just like crushing because it's not like, you know, I'm, I imagine by this point, the whole changing outfit and grappling hook things had already been re revised to what we see in the final game. And so it's not even I mean, representative I, you, of what they're you, working on. Right. But you, you either, you either know that and you're either telling me that you know that to be the case that it was all changed or you're speculating. I don't, I don't know which one it is, but so many things can change in the, in the course of a year. I, I get why it can be frustrating for them. Many developers, have had their game announced to the world with footage that is not exactly representative of the game. I mean, every pre-rendered trailer ever, you know. Well, no, but but but, but the pre-rendered trailers are meant for public consumption, though. These things are just these are never meant to be shown to anyone. There's a big difference between um, a game that looks different from how it was revealed to the public. Like Ubisoft was never going to release this and be like, "This is how our game's going to look." This is like these are the ideas we have at right. the start of production, how we expect it to look at the end. Like just to make sure we're all on the same page, like as a team. Right. And it's never ever meant to to be shown, like to to represent the game externally. I think it's one of the biggest uh, things issues I ha that that made me upset about this and so uh, so obviously on the dev side that's got to be disappointing not only not just to see it leaked outside of um, th how you would like it to be revealed but sure. to have the thing that's being revealed not even actually representative of what you're working on so okay sucks for Ubisoft pretty across, much across the board right and so the only two other parties in this are pretty much the, the, <laughs> the <laughs> I don't completely agree with you it sucks for Ubisoft across the board okay, oh, okay. <laughs> let's go with that so the other two parties in this are Kotaku and the readers and so if you look at the readership I honestly, and I know this is like the crux of your argument, and I, I, you know, I agree with a lot of things you say in in the fault piece about a, a price of games journalism, like some of the principles you're talking about, but not in this case for some of them, um, okay. because I argue that, I, like to me, when I see this, I don't think it serves the readers either. And not the way that the piece is written, because a most people are going to gloss over the fact that this is hard gameplay footage and assume that this is what it looks like. It's misrepresenting it. Um, and then the other piece is that the timing of this matters a lot, as like almost as much as whether or not it was leaked at all. Because right on the heels, like right in the midst of all the glitchiness and everything, is not when people it, like. I think it's unfair to. You're still talking about the company, and that it's unfair to them. It's not unfair to the reader to know as much as they can about next year's Assassin's Creed. It's fair for the reader to be aware of it whenever the reader becomes aware of it. It's, if, you're, if you're approaching it from like a consumer perspective or just from somebody who cares about the series, see, I disagree fundamentally with the idea that the marketing schedule that Assassin's Creed is on right now is automatically the best way for people to know about the series. And Ubisoft, for whatever reason, has felt that the way that people should know about the series is that they really should not know a thing about the given year's game until about six months prior. And I could, I could completely bash that and say, well, that's just marketing and that's them not having confidence in the game. And I think that would be overly simplistic. I'm sure that there's also benefits to creators to be able to create in peace without having people second-guessing them and armchair quarterbacking and all the other cliches. So there's probably multiple reasons that you could argue some I'd be more sympathetic with and some I wouldn't be as sympathetic with. Regarding regarding whether it would make sense, whether it's good that you don't know about Assassin's Creed until six months beforehand, but I actually, I but I believe that if I am somebody who's interested in playing these games, I'm interested in knowing about these games, that that it's not a a problem for me if I know about next year's game before, while I while this year's is still coming out, and if I can know that when I'm looking at the seven minute video, then who am I? To say that I deserve to have this information and know this information, but my reader doesn't. Like that to me is elitist, and it's not. It's not the. My goal is to narrow the gap between what I know as a reporter and what my readership knows. I agree with you that there are definitely sensitivity issues with the developers, and I always think about sure. these le these leak-based stories in terms of what's the way that we can do these that's the most respectful to the creator creators, but also fits within my ethic of what I think reporters should be doing. And there are definitely tensions there. And some of what you were saying, I agree with and I'm sympathetic to, and I really don't relish being in the position to have these leaks. And some may, people may say that's crocodile tears, you're happy with the page views you got. But I see the nuances and I see the difficult challenges there. And I would be, like I said, I would, be, I would be perfectly happy to not get a leak of next year's Assassin's Creed, Call of Duty, <laughs> whatever. And, because that's not, the, that's not the reporting I'm most interested in.
But when it comes to when it comes to notif- telling readers what's going on, I really have a hard time with the idea that well, in this case, the readers didn't need to know because it was this, that, or the other thing. Or in this case, the readers didn't need to know because of this. Like you can carve out a million exceptions to why the readers don't need to know a thing about a thing, and then you wind up not telling them anything. So my fundamental um, problem with this, I think, is uh, like okay, I love I, I love this series, right? I want it to succeed um, as a fan. I think in a case like this, I have like I feel just I just feel very strongly that um, what the Quebec team works on, uh, the game that they work on, deserves to kind of live and die by its own merits, uh, and not necessarily. And the, and so a lot of problems I had with this um, when it came out is um, going back to the timing. I mean, it's I I, I don't think you'll disagree with me that. Um, this information coming out right in right after Unity was released, um, in the midst of all the you know crazy screenshots and and backlash about the graphics and everything, um, primed people to have a more negative reaction to Syndicate than maybe if they had waited three to six months. I don't I have know. No if idea you... if that's true or not. I have no idea. That's your, that's okay. Well, no, I don't know for certain, but I'm pretty sure, right? Like this is just like. But it's the truth. The truth is that there was another one in development. If the only way to get people excited about next year's game is to pretend that it isn't coming out yet, like that to me is like a failed model. That's just I think it's an illogical business model. Yeah, but that's not what you guys published. You guys published a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't even in the final game, and that's part of what I mean by like the the game that they work on deserves to like live and die by its own merit, and not based on what they had produced internally for themselves. Like previously, because I think half- people's takeaway from the footage that we, the, that we excerpted a couple of screenshots and details from isn't that next year's Assassin's Creed game is going to have outfit changing and a swingable uh, rope launcher. It was it's set in Victorian London. It's a new character. It's building on the engine of of the previous game. But yeah, look, the story. I'm not saying the story was all roses for Ubisoft, and they should love that the story ran. Like, yeah, yeah, it's no. it's a. Uh, it's certainly a thing that plenty of there can be plenty of debate about, and I, I hear what you're saying. As somebody, the, yeah. you're, you want the series to succeed. You don't want to see things that feel unnecessarily getting in the way of its success. That Unity was enough of a debacle that that poisoned people's enthusiasm for this really wonderful series that you and I both enjoy. Um, I get it. You lament the fact, and I get it. I get that you lament the fact that this, if this, if not for this leak. Maybe there would have been some like calming down about this series and not this knee jerk, oh God, another one already again, which added to some negativity that you know probably made it harder for Ubisoft to get people excited about about the the new year's the next game uh, there's just aspects of this that, that you and I disagree on, and I think that that's it sure. is certainly thorny because it's you're talking about something that the world didn't have to know. So there's room for people to question then, you know, did this story need to run? I think that's like, it's a worthwhile question to explore and to push around. And if history shows that we made the wrong decision, maybe history is showing that, I don't know, then, you know, we'll, then we'll learn from it that way. But I mean, it didn't, thankfully, for where we agree, is that it didn't, thankfully, it did not prevent Assassin's Creed Syndicate from being a wonderful game. It is a wonderful game. And, you know, we'll, we'll sort of see what happens from there, but I, and I listened to all the feedback, positive and negative, and certainly think about the, all that. Like I said, there was response to the story we ran about Unity, where people were saying, um, "Wow, the game looks bad," and I felt I felt bad about that because that I never intended that to be one of the takeaways of that story. That people would comment on the on the poor quality of the graphics, and I was worried people would have that takeaway. And I tried to prevent that by making sure that when Jason Trier, the reporter, ran the piece, we said we right. pointed out to people, "This is work in progress. It'll you know surely look better." And I didn't prevent that from being the reaction, and I learned from that. And so I wanted to make sure that when we were doing anything related to the the victory stuff, when that came in, that at the very least we didn't make the game look needlessly bad. As we wrap up real quick, why don't we spend a couple minutes? Um, thoughts on Syndicate now that it's out? I know you didn't do the review on Kotaku, but uh, what are your thoughts on it? Syndicate's fantastic. I really had a great time with it. Um, I, like all the other ones, I'm going to go back to it, I guess, early next year and play you know, 100% on the side quest. I did like most of the Child Liberation stuff already, 
Um, I think I've done all the zone liberate, you know, the zone clearing as well. But there's other quest lines I haven't done nearly as much. Uh, in I, I was a little bummed when I finally got to the se- the secret area that it was not as fleshed out as I was I was hoping it would be. It feels a little bit, oh. you know, sort of like. I don't know, like the turret stuff, right? The 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 stu- you know, mm-hmm. right? I don't know how spoiler you you get it when you're talking. Oh, oh at this point, full spoilers. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So the stuff where you're shooting at blimps, like, just felt yeah. very slight. And um, I like I thought they did a nice job with the uh, what's her name, Lydia. Lydia. Yep. Yeah. I th- I thought they did a nice job with her look and her outfit for the period and everything, but there's just like it was much more confined. I was hoping it was going to be bigger, but I guess we always want more, right? Um, <laughs> I like the I really like the rope launcher, and I'm. I thought that really freshened up the city gameplay. I find that the thing that I'm missing the most from Unity and then even still from Syndicate is the wilderness. I think that we we didn't realize, maybe we didn't really appreciate it. I didn't appreciate the value of having the open terrain in the middle of AC1. It was kind of underpopulated. Mm. And AC2 was all city, and I think we were into that. I was. Yeah. But Brotherhood, the part of Rome where it's like near the Colosseum and beyond and you're like much mm-hmm. more in the countryside... I thought that added a really nice extra dynamic in terms of pacing and movement and everything. And that three then really realized the strength of having wilderness and nature as part of what you move through. And I wound up missing that a lot in Unity. And I miss that in Syndicate as well. I think that the series, my ideal Assassin's Creed games going forward would have a mix of city and some aspect of nature, be it the ocean that you're sailing on or jungles and forests that you're, yeah. you're running through. Yeah, AC4 was really nice in that respect, too. Not only just the open ocean, but like as you go to these islands, having you know the forest that you walk through, as you're going through with James Kidd to the Mayan uh, temple and stuff. Yeah. I, I really yeah. love that part, too. Yeah, absolutely. Four, I felt like 4 was showing, though, the, the them having fewer and fewer ideas of what cool stuff to do in cities or really towns in that game. <laughs> and that, that they were really running, they were just repeating the same gameplay loops of climbing high points, you know, trailing guys. 4 was notorious for having so many trailing missions. Yep. And that Unity didn't really have any solutions to that in terms of freshening up the city gameplay. And I, I don't, the black box mm. missions, I think we all had a lot of hope for, and I, don't, I didn't find them to be as flexible and interesting as hoped. And Syndicate has yeah. edged a little closer to finding fresh stuff in city-based gameplay, but my gut tells me that the, the fresher opportunities are still in the less explored wilderness nature things. I mean, even yeah. some of the stuff that AC Rogue was doing where if you really go off the beaten path, and go after some of the collectibles and some of the islands, like in the, um, not the frigid map. River, River Valley, I think is what it's called. That if, you, that if you go into some of the big islands there, they do some interesting things with almost creating these like linear, almost like corridors of Assassin's Creed action. They take the secret location kind of design concept from the earlier games, uh-huh. and they found a way to put it actually inside the open world. And I thought that was really, really cool. There's a lot of, a lot of possibility there. Uh, and what do you think? So we're recording this on December 10th. It's a Thursday. Five days from now, Jack the Ripper is coming out. They just dropped a trailer literally this morning, uh, yep. which we've both seen it. What do you think? What are your <laughs> What are your thoughts on what it looks like and your hopes, worries? My my hope is that it's not Jack as, as or not uh, Jacob, Jacob as Jack. Yeah, right? I, I hope it's not that because that's what everybody's predicting. So that's like, what everyone says, right? Like, where's Jacob? And like, yeah, so I'm hoping it's not that. I, I just hope it's substantial. I had a, I had really high hopes for Dead Kings last year and then was disappointed. I mean, it was mm. created by Montpellier, right? That was the lead yes. studio. And it was their first uh, time dipping their toe in the AC franchise. And, you know, I was actually a little disappointed in Dead Kings in that it felt kind of... Uh, uh, it wasn't really unique or different in a way that I would have expected from the studio that does the Rayman games and Beyond Good and Evil. You know, that has more of a creative, like almost indie streak yes. than a lot of the other ones. That's right. That and they had yeah. made they made that really underappreciated, I guess, formerly Wii U exclusive Zombie U. I believe that was the same studio. And when I saw the Dead Kings was taking kind of a horrorish vibe, I thought, oh, maybe it's the Zombie U people and they're going to have some interesting things that they do with that. And then, but there really, I mean, there was less of a gameplay change than there was with Freedom Cry, where they did a lot of stuff, you know, some, some co- controversial to some people, but how they basically used uh, liberating enslaved people as, a, as sort of a, 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 its own system within the right, game. Right, right, yep, yep. And kind of like free, you know, the slave ships and having to sort of not destroy them while destroying all the enemy ships around them. And so you saw like, okay, they've taken the core ideas of AC4 and then done some nice riffs on it. And I was, I was hoping for some of that in Dead Kings. I didn't get that. I don't know if that's possible for a syndicate um with the with the jack the ripper thing 
But I, I got to say, like, Syndicate has the advantage in that I like the characters a lot more than I like the Unity characters. So I simply care about what's going to happen to Eevee next. Like, I'm interested in that. And I'm interested in, you know, knowing the, the future lives of, of these characters. So I'm in it at least for the fiction. Yeah, I when I was watching that trailer, it just struck me. It was like, wow, this this DLC is going to have like a middle aged woman protagonist, and that very rarely happens in games, and that's kind of cool. I like that. I imagine you and I are on the same page in response to a lot of the Assassin's Creed Unity female assassin oh. <laughs> controversy, and that the series didn't really get its due when that controversy was going around for how diverse its cast yes. had been before that. I mean, I was playing as Aveline with Patience Gibbs flirting with me in the AC4 <laughs> expansion, you know, yeah. uh, just, you know, six months before that. Um, it's, and that's one of those instances where I feel like Ubisoft's secrecy comes to sort of bite itself on the ass and that Unity wasn't going to have a, fem- a playable female assassin. But uh, I guess the odds are decent that they knew by then that Syndicate would. And maybe they didn't know yet. Yeah. But I would think that by then they knew, like, would it really have hurt Unity to have said, we're not doing it in this game, but we're planning a female assassin in, in, in one of our upcoming Assassin's Creed games. So I imagine maybe the apprehension would be, hey, we don't know if we're going to have to then cut that feature and people will flip out. But I don't know. I mean, I think if you just level with people and you say, we're not doing it this game, but we're thinking about it for the next game, you know, for one of the ones down the line. We've done it before. Yeah, yeah. And, well, I mean, to be fair, U- Ubisoft kind of messed that whole thing up, too, by saying that, you know, their initial response was, oh, women, it would have been twice as much work to animate women or whatever. When Except I assume that guy was telling the truth that that was, like, from his perspective as an animator, I imagine that for him, that was the true reason that it wasn't done. And he didn't mean, like, it's impossible in general to animate a female character. Again, I think yeah. that the game company's approach of, let's say, as little as possible, I mean, there was the whole controversy with the Far Cry Four box art, and I thought that controversy was so mm, overblown. Yeah, yeah. But at the time, you had Alex Hutchinson, the creative director of the game, uh, saying, you know, pe- the box art may not be what people think. It's something like that. He said something like that on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was at a time when Ubisoft would not even confirm that Alex Hutchinson was the creative director <laughs> on Far Cry Four, because their thing was, we only want to let the box art speak for the game. Which, by the way, speaking of things that don't may not represent the contents of a game, I mean, to say nothing of my pre-visualized trailer or whatever that, that, that we ran of, of, uh, of, of Victory slash Syndicate. You know, but it's yeah. like, here's a publisher caught up in maybe it's a bogus controversy, maybe it's not, regarding the Far Cry 4 box art or the Assassin's Creed Unity female, prota- you know, playable female protagonist. And you see a publisher that, like, doesn't ever take the approach of, Let's just explain what the hell we're doing. Like, let's just sit, let's <laughs> let's just correct the record. Well, I think especially lately they're very very controlling of like the message. I think to to their detriment in some cases. I agree with you in a lot of them. And and yeah, to be fair, like you know, I, I've I've talked a lot about like I don't think that the victory. Um, target footage represents the game fairly uh, to be fair i give ubisoft a lot of shit for some of their pre-rendered especially like the ac3 e3 trailer having like nothing to do with the game like connor running into the battlefield on a horse if you and, play you know, the benedict right? arnold dlc it's uh, a little I closer xbox. i did not know oh. that. damn see oh. i had an xbox so i never speaking played of, any of this speaking of more frank and blunt answers though we talked about patrice way back when when we were in the beginning of yeah. this conversation and I talked to him, about, I remember that when AC2 was about to come out, Ubisoft had said that there was going to be exclusive maps or f- for certain retailers. And I was confused by that because the game was only single player, so what did they mean? And it turned out to be like certain locations that you could sort of warp to from the main AC2 map. Um, you could access... You know, Templar Lairs, I think, in yeah, AC2. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. And I remember doing an interview with him, and I'm pretty sure it was before the game came out. I may be misremembering, but I'm pretty sure it was before the game came out. And I'm like, you know... What's up with this? Like, is this really only going to be exclusive to these retailers forever? And that, that's how the publishers are, right? They would never say, like, oh, don't worry, everybody else can get it six months later. <laughs> they're trying to goose the pre-orders for whatever retailer. But right. Patrice was, like, blunt. Like, he didn't care. Like, he was going to just say what was what. And he said, look, I want to be able to play this stuff, too, so I'm going to make sure it's eventually available for everybody. And that, that was so real. <laughs> I was like, yes, that's what I'm looking for, is, like, people to just be, like, have the ability to just say what's really going on and it's obviously very difficult yeah. in the world of corporate gaming for creators to get that permission or to take that risk or for for whoever else i mean he navigated another fiasco or potential fiasco with the fact that ac2 remember they just didn't have two chapters like you were playing through the sequence yeah. like you <laughs> they went, cut it and put it out as dlc 
yeah. one of the few cases where they literally, the thing that people usually accuse game publishers of actually happened, where they actually did cut out part of the game and sell it as DLC. Well, he, has, he had said it to me in a, uh, he'd said it to me in a, whatchamacallit, in a, in an interview that I had done with him where I was asking, I think it was like a year end interview that year, just like I was talking to interesting people in the, in the gaming industry and in the gaming culture in general, I guess the, the people I was interviewing and he had, I'd asked him, I'm like, you know, what was up with that? And he said, well, we realized in the summer that we weren't going to be able to finish it. So we put that yeah. stuff on hold. And I mean, he could, you know, he could have been, you know, feeding me a line there, but that, that had the ring of truth to it that you get to a point where you're yeah. like, well, we got to ship the game on November, whatever it is. Or It was already a massive game. You know, it felt pretty complete even without those two in it, I felt. I, I think it worked all right without them. Do you remember, did they charge for them? I can't remember if they charged they for them. They did charge them. It's, uh, Battle it's, of and, and the other one, yeah. And the Bonfire of the Vanities. I think they were $5 each sequence. Yeah. Which at this point sounds super cheap, but yeah. Yeah, I, <laughs> it does actually, yeah. <laughs> oh, $10 season pass. Yeah, so I don't know. I'm I'm I am forever uh, an Assassin's Creed uh, optimist. I was optimistic about AC Chronicles China. Maybe a little too optimistic. I'm optimistic <laughs> now that India and Russia will be better than China. Yeah. Um, and I'll probably be disappointed in some way about that, yeah. but I hope not. And I'm optimistic. You know, after Unity, I was optimistic about Dead Kings and you know yeah. Syndicate. I enjoyed a lot, and yet I'm I'm already eager and hungry to play Jack the Ripper, and I think they have another mission pack coming out. Beyond. Yeah, it's the last Maharaja thing, yeah. I think. I don't think it's going to be as big as Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper is like uh-huh. the big thing, but it's like a set of missions, I think. I also haven't played, I've only played a couple of the Penny Dreadful uh, uh, Merc. Oh, they're Dreadful so good. Crimes. They're really they're good. Crimes. They're so good. They're I'm so good. really impressed with how they improved on that from Unity. Um, I'm, I'm really happy with it. How cool. crazy is that that, that's a, that was a oh, man. sense of <laughs> Well, to be fair, at least this time they're going to actually release it after six months or whatever. Because like the old stuff for pretty much all the old PlayStation exclusive content from Brotherhood to AC4 has never come out on Xbox. I know that, anything, yeah. Right? I'm happy this time that it's coming out on Xbox Me too. eventually. Me too. I, I think that's the right call. It would be nice if it came out the same day for everybody. People, some people's reaction to the piece about us being blacklisted by Bethesda and Ubisoft was, you know, well, serves you right, and all your, you're just whining about not getting free games and, and what have you. But um, it, when I said in there that, that the thing that bothered me the most by far about this was just the lack of reply for comment when we report stories, that's, mm. that's the truth. Because there were instances like that. And the lead into Syndicate, here are some examples of things that I asked Ubisoft for comment for this year that they did not all acknowledge. When the Assassin's Creed games were announced for PlayStation Now, I asked about whether or not Rogue would be included in it, which initially was not in the initial list, because they knew that that game was something that both people, you know, that the game deserved more of a, more attention, but that also it just seemed technically pe- feasible that it could have been put on yeah. PlayStation Now. Well, also it's good because then if you had a PlayStation 4, you could play this game that is not available for your platform exactly. because it was only last gen, right? So I thought that that would be to the benefit of readers and the Assassin's Creed community to know that. I sent them a question about that. They did not reply. Uh, when there was um, the Assassin's Creed Uplay app, or no, the, the Ubisoft Uplay app came out and had a, an achievement, a Uplay achievement or whatever they call it, that seemed to indicate that microtransactions were back and that had been a controversial aspect of Unity. I reached out to Ubisoft about that and whether or not the, you know, obviously the screens were, were real or I was able to capture them myself on my iPad looking at the Uplay app. And I wanted to get an understanding of how they were handling microtransactions because I felt like people would like to know one way or the other. They did not reply to that. I think they eventually talked about that yeah. a few weeks after that leak. I really enjoyed that article you made about Unity's micro... Well, I, I enjoy a lot of Assassin's Creed articles that you guys write. Yeah. Well, mostly you, um, that because you're like such a big fan, you'll go and do these things. Like, what happens if I buy all the credits? Or right, I paid a guy, one... gave, a guy, <laughs> gave a guy the license to write. I spent 100 bucks on this. It was actually a freelancer <laughs> that I do that. Oh, was, okay, good, I, yeah. Who, but I, I, I commissioned the piece, and this is a guy who was like an expert in microtransactions. The, and the other thing that I had asked Ubisoft about, at least in the lead up to Syndicate, that I was really hopeful to get an answer on, was questions just about you know whether it was the Penny Dreadful or the Dreadful Crimes, rather, or whether it was you know a lot of the other a lot of the other pieces of content that seemed like they were getting carved off as retail or platform exclusives. I was just looking to find out if they would say whether they were timed or whether they were long term. And I did my research about whether or not the Copernicus stuff from AC Brotherhood ever came out and that kind of thing. And I, I ran an article that broke it down as best I could, but it was all sort of groping around in the dark. 
Because when a company decides that they don't want to talk to you anymore, it doesn't really matter what stories you're doing. And so that's, that to me was what I lamented about that, in that I will continue to ask the questions that I think that fans of Assassin's Creed or any other series will want to have asked. Um, if at the very least asking those questions publicly compels an answer to come out in some roundabout way through a blog or through a tweet or whatever, great. Yeah. But it's my job to still try to find that information out. You know, I'll continue to tr- continue to try to do it because I think it's a series that's super fascinating, and certainly uh, people have their own strong feelings about it. Um, you know, we talked about some of the strong feelings in this this sure. call, <laughs> where I think you and I both reject the idea that it's just some Call of Duty every year that where yeah. supposedly nothing changes. I bet, by the way, if we were hardcore COD people, we would see that you know <laughs> that uh, that series is the same. But I do appreciate I appreciate you taking all this time to talk to me about all this as well. I love talking about it. They're knocking on the door to the room though, so I probably gotta gotta go any second. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, yeah, thank you so much. And like I said, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat and give your perspective on a lot of these things. And for the most part, I really, really love like the articles you read. Like nobody else cared that Ezio's voice changed, like except for you yeah, in the, in the yeah. news industry. So like as a fan, I really appreciate it. wouldn't appreciate comment, on, like that that. Either, yeah. wouldn't comment <laughs> on that one either, Lumer. wouldn't comment on that one either. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much. Um, Steven, we c- people can follow you on Twitter, of course, at twitter.com slash Steven Dottillo. Anything else? Otherwise, they'll just see your writing on Kotaku.com, yes, of yes, course. Yeah, you're willing to brave it. Go to Kotaku.com. Common <laughs> stuff that we write about, um, and hopefully you'll find some stuff there that you that you find you know uh, is is worth your while that is interesting and relevant to the games that you play and enjoy. We do focus on covering games more, as more as much as we can post release. Um, we uh, and we'll continue to cover Assassin's Creed Syndicate for as long as it remains interesting, and I still think it's pretty interesting. So keep up the good work with the podcast too. I like the work that you're doing oh, in terms of getting more conversation going about the series. And and, you know, showing the care and the attention to detail that I think, you know, this series merits. So it's really cool. So thank you again, Stephen. Um, and stay tuned for more episodes soon of the Assassin's Den podcast. You can follow them on youtube.com slash Loomer, my YouTube channel. And you can find me on Twitter and Facebook at Loomer979. So until then, we'll see you later. Bye. Bye.